In our first lesson on atomic physics, we saw how cathode rays were discovered. And then we saw how Hittorf in 1869 was able to cast shadows with cathode rays and come to the conclusion that cathode rays travel in straight lines. And then a year later, Sir William Crookes showed that cathode rays have momentum and energy by making a little pinwheel turn around by their impulse or impact. He was able to show they have energy and momentum. Now today we're going to first take up a third important experiment concerning cathode rays, a discovery made by Jean Perrin in France some years later, some 25 years later to be exact. Perrin found that cathode rays are charged particles. Charged particles. This was an important discovery. His apparatus was similar to that drawn here on the board and which I'm going to demonstrate later for you. A discharge tube made of glass, a long tube here, with a metal electrode here connected to the negative side of a battery and called the cathode. And here a positive piece of metal called the positive electrode and because it's connected to the positive side of the battery often referred to as the anode, the anode. Now from the cathode uh, there stream these cathode rays. Now Perrin put into the discharge tube a metal disc or screen here that the cathode rays had to hit and in the center of it a little slot through which some of the cathode rays could stream and since they knew at that time, and he knew, that fluorescence would be produced by the cathode rays striking fluorescent materials, he put a long screen in here, painted with fluorescent paint, so he could see the stream of cathode rays as they went down the length of the tube. Then he placed around the tube here a magnet, so that there was a magnetic field here perpendicular to the beam, and he found that the beam would bend. Now it would only bend if the cathode rays were electrically charged. Furthermore, by knowing the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of motion, he could conclude whether they were negatively charged particles or positively charged particles. Now let me show you the experiment. Here's the apparatus, consisting first of all of an induction coil that produces the high voltage and a switch for turning it on. The battery is under the table. The high voltage electrodes of the induction coil are connected to the two ends of this glass tube. Now in this particular tube, the cathode is over here on your right. And the little screen with a slot in it is here just in front of it, just beyond it. And the cathode rays coming in here will strike this little piece of metal. It's a strip of aluminum here that's been painted with fluorescent paint. Now the cathode rays as they stream down there will make a, a path that will appear blue in color or as a bright streak if you're seeing this in black and white. And here is a horseshoe magnet and I'm going to place this magnet over the beam like this and we'll see that it bends either up or down. <clears throat> now the north pole of the magnet is this one here and I'm first going to put the magnet down with the north pole nearest you so that the magnetic lines now you see go across between the north and south pole here horizontally going away from you. And the beam then going through here will have a force on it either up or down. You see at right angles to both. Now let's turn this on and see what, so what happens. I'll first without the magnet. And there you see the beam. I'm turning it on, on and off so you can see the beam appears. On, off, on, off, on. Now I'll leave it on and move the magnet down on it and you see it bends the beam up. Now I'll turn the magnet around so that the south pole is nearest you. That reverses the magnetic field. And the beam bends down. As I bring the magnet down, the beam bends down. Now with the north pole nearest you, the beam bends up. So one sees that this beam is bent by the application of a magnetic field at right angles to the stream. Now you remember with the north pole nearest you, the beam bent up. Now let's apply the left-hand rule, assuming these are negative charges, to see if that's the way they, would, they should bend. The left-hand rule says put the thumb in the direction of motion. Since they're cathode rays coming from the cathode, we know they're traveling from right to left. 
So we imagine grasping this beam with our left hand. The fingers then point in the direction of the magnetic field due to the magnet on the underside of the beam, where the field then is strengthened and exert a force on the charged particles away from that strong field up. Now had the beam bent down with the North Pole nearest you here, then we would have had it conclude that they were positively charged particles. But by knowing this is a North Pole, and by knowing the direction of the beam, one concludes that they are negatively charged particles. Jean Perrin's discovery of these charged particles and that they were negatively charged. Now, soon after Perrin's discovery, many people began experimenting with these charged particles to learn other things about them. And J.J. Thompson, an Englishman, uh, found, was the first to answer a number of very puzzling questions about cathode rays. J.J. Thompson asked the question, and many others did too, are cathode rays, these particles, these charged, negative charged particles, are they all alike? Are they all alike? This was the major question. And by all alike, one means, first of all, do they all have the same charge? Exactly. Well, now, the beam you saw bent as a whole, one would think they were probably all, of the, they were all alike. Probably they all had the same charge, but do they? Could one measure the charge? Do they all have the same charge? Third, do they all have the same mass? Do they all have the same weight or mass? If they, since they bend alike, again, you might conclude they are all the same mass. But are they really? Might not some of them be twice as heavy as others and carry twice as much charge and therefore be bent the same amount in the magnetic field? These were important questions to try to answer. And there were a number of years passed by and a number of very famous experiments performed before these questions could be answered. And I'm going to describe two important classic experiments today that to the scientists are considered classics of the past. These experiments were done around the turn of the century one of them around 1900 and the other around 1910, within several years, one way or the other. Now, the first experiment is known as J.J. Thompson's experiment. In it, he determined the charge divided by the mass of the electron and also the speed of cathode rays. His uh, apparatus consisted of a discharge tube made of glass that has the shape shown here. And this shape is not greatly different than the modern television receiver screen and the oscilloscope tube with which some of you are familiar and in principle is a great deal like it. Now in this glass tube which was highly evacuated he had a cathode over here or a metal electrode a cathode to produce cathode rays these, these electrons we now know they are and then the anode was in the form of a little disc with a hole in the center tiny pinhole and another anode here with another pinhole so that he could get a very narrow beam of cathode rays coming down the tube. Then at the far end of the tube, here was some fluorescent paint so that the stream of cathode rays, and cathode rays are invisible, we only see them when they strike some fluorescent material, they would produce a bright spot right here at the center. But now in the path of these beams, he, he was able to produce an electric field, try to deflect them, or a magnetic field, or both. Inside the tube were two metal plates here. And by connecting them to a battery, he could produce here an electric field and exert forces on these charged particles and bend them in their path to a new point on the screen. Or by applying a magnetic field here, by, uh, this circle represents the poles, the two poles of a magnet seen end on, a magnetic field, the lines being perpendicular to the board, he could bend the beam up or down as he likes, but here it's shown bent up to another spot on the screen. So he could apply an electric field or a magnetic field. Now I'm going to spend a little time discussing the bending of particles in electric and magnetic fields because these principles we will see applied over and over again in many different ways, not only in atomic physics, but in nuclear physics later on. The principles of cyclotrons, atomic accelerators, and many other pieces of apparatus used today in the laboratory are based upon these fundamental equations and principles. So I want you to pay very close attention and particular to the equations. They're very simple in form and they're simple in application. They may seem 
a little complex at first. Now here is a diagram, first of all, of two metal plates representing the two plates inside of Thompson's apparatus. To the two plates he applied a different uh, a voltage. And uh, giving the upper plate a negative charge, the lower plate a positive charge. Now this produces between the plates an electric field E of intensity E. Remember we represented field between plates, uniform electric field by the letter E. Now these cathode rays or electrons that come in from the left are designated here by three quantities. First of all, small e represents the amount of charge on these particles. And we're given the negative sign because it's negatively charged. E is the amount of negative charge. M represents the mass of the electron and small v represents the speed or velocity. Three things we want to know about electrons. We do not know yet, or Thompson did not know this, this, nor this. They were things he wanted to know and others wanted to know. Now these particles come streaming into this field. And as soon as they enter this electric field between these plates, there's a force on them. They're attracted by the lower plate, repelled by the upper one, there's a force on them. And you remember the force on a charged particle is given by the electric field strength times the charge. At any rate, this force, however these particles move, is always straight down because that's the direction of the field. And so this path is the path of a parabola. It's the same kind of a path you have when a projectile is projected horizontally and the earth pulls on it with a constant force. It follows a parabolic path. Well, here the force is parallel and it follows a parabolic path. Now the electric field intensity E, you remember, is given by this equation. The voltage applied to the plates divided by the distance between them in meters. Volts per meter. Now, the force on the charged particles, force, is given by the electric field intensity times the charge on the particles. Now, you can measure V and D, but this quantity is an unknown. However, this equation shows that the force on those charged particles is given by the electric field intensity times the charge on the electron. Now let's look at the magnetic field, the equations and the principles involved in the magnetic field. The magnetic field in here, you see, represented by this little circle, represents the two poles of a magnet coming end to end, and you're looking end on. Now here's a detailed diagram of that arrangement. This circle represents one of the poles of the electromagnet, circular in form. And you're looking end on at the magnetic field lines. The lines would be coming out from the board in this case, from north to south, be coming out from the board. B, the magnetic induction we say is out. Now here's our stream of electrons. Here's one of them coming streaming in from the left. Charge, E, velocity, V, and mass, M again. Now they enter a magnetic field. Now they experience a force given by the uh, rules we've had before from the direction of motion, the charge, the force is at right angles to the field and at right angles to the direction of motion. Now if B is out in this diagram and these are negatively charged, the force is up. Just as it enters the field here, the force will be straight up. But as it moves then in a curved path, always the force stays at right angles to the direction of motion. And when it gets up here, the force will be in this direction at right angles to the direction of motion. See, this is different from an electric field. The force here changes direction all the time. And furthermore, the force will depend upon the velocity. The force F will depend on the velocity, where that, is, that wasn't true in the electric field. The velocity had nothing to do with the force. It was just given by the electric field strength times the charge. So these, this particle now will move in the arc of a circle. The force is always at right angles to the direction. It's like a centripetal force, you see. Stone on the end of a string. The force is a central force. Now let r, small r, represent the radius of that circular path. Now we come to the formulas. Now here is our first important equation. And you better write this down. The force on a charged particle in a field, moving at right angles to the magnetic induction, is given by the strength of the field, that is, the magnetic induction B, times the charge on the particle, times the velocity. Force on a charged particle is given by B times E times V. Now, this force causes it to move in a circle because it acts like a centripetal force. 
And one can write then from mechanics, centripetal force is m v squared over r, where m is the mass of our particle, the mass of the electron, v again is its velocity, and r is the radius of its path. That you can measure. So we have two fu form fundamental formulas here, one from mechanics, one from electrostatics, or from, from e electrodynamics. Now, this force is the one that gives rise to this centripetal force that makes it moves in circles. So you can, re you can place those two things equal to each other. And write, B times E times V is equal to MV squared over R. The electromagnetic force is equal to the centripetal force because that is the force that produces the centripetal force that makes it move in a circle. Now you see you can cancel, this is V times V over here, V squared. You can cancel one of those V's with this one and then uh, juggle these letters around and, and obtain finally E divided by M. See, these are quantities about the electron. It's charge divided by its mass equals the velocity divided by the magnetic induction times the radius of the circle. All of these quantities are known, well, these two quantities are known, this one is not known. Now, this is what Thompson did. He noted that by applying these two fields at the same time, he could neutralize one field with the other, and uh, hence make uh, some uh, calculations possible that were not otherwise possible. You see, if he applied the electric field alone and bent the beam away from this point down to here, then if he applied the magnetic field, he could bend it back up again. See, with the magnetic field alone, he could bend it from here up to here, exert an upward force on it in here in the magnetic field, or he could exert a downward force to the electric field, or he could uh, exert both forces by turning on both fields. And by varying the current in the magnet, he could adjust the upward force, upward deflection, and upward force, so it was exactly equal to the downward one, and then the beam would come right straight through again. The two forces would be balanced if they came right straight through. Well, now that you could do very easily, because you could locate the spot without any field, then turn on the fields and adjust them until it comes back to the same spot. Now, what, what good did this do him? Well, he could say with the electric field, he obtained a force F equals E times E. With a magnetic field, the force is B times E times B. He could say these two are equal to each other. They're exactly equal, and you could replace E, E equals B, E, V. You could write this equality. Only under those circumstances where the fields were balanced. Now you see the charge on the electron cancels out. And one obtains E equals B times B. Putting the B on the other side, you get E over B is equal to V. In other words, the velocity is simply given by the ratio of the two field strengths. Now, one could measure or calculate this because you know the voltage you applied and the distance between the plates. B you can calculate because you know the current and the electromagnets, and you know their size and dimensions. And so he found, he calculated V. that with 10,000 volts applied between the anode and cathode of his discharge tube, that the velocity of the cathode rays, the electrons, was equivalent to 60 million meters per second. This is about one-fifth of the velocity of light, about 36,000 miles a second, a very, very high speed. So this was an important discovery. How fast? were the electrons moving. How fast were these cathode rays moving? About one-fifth of velocity of light. Now then, his next step was the following. Knowing the speed of the electrons or cathode rays in here, he applied the magnetic field alone, the field due to the magnet alone, and deflected the beam from here up to here. And by measuring that deflection, he could calculate the radius of the path in here. Knowing how big the pole was, he could calculate small r. And from small r, from knowing that then, he could put that in this formula. He could put in the radius here, and the magnetic induction here, known, and his velocity, one-fifth the speed of light, and find this ratio, E over M.
Now this ratio is a very important ratio in atomic structure. It's the ratio of the charge on an electron to its mass in kilograms. E in coulombs divided by the mass in kilograms. Now Thompson found by his experiments and one has since found by many repetitions of this and similar experiments that E over M has a value 1.76 times 10 to the 11th power coulombs uh, per, this should be kilogram, not seconds. One point seven six times ten to the eleventh power coulombs per kilogram. Now all this number really means to us here really is that it's a very large number, but it's the ratio between E and M. It means that the charge on the electron in coulombs compared to the mass in kilograms is a very large number. Its specific value, however, is of importance. Now we turn to the second classic experiment of the past. And the not too distant past either. Around 1910 to 1915. The famous oil drop experiment of Ari Millikan, an American scientist, who determined for the first time with any precision at all the charge E on the electron. Now what Millikan did is diagrammed here on board. Millikan set up two metal plates parallel to each other again to form an electric field. An electric field here which now is such that the force would be, would be up on a negatively charged particle. And then into this field through a pinhole in the top center of the top plate he would obtain a tiny drop of oil. And this he did by using a perfume atomizer here with a little oil in it and squeezing the bulb would produce a spray of tiny oil drops. Now when you atomize or vaporize uh, oils or any liquid, uh, the particles, the little drops become charged. But at any rate, uh, as these little drops of oil would fall, occasionally one would fall through this tiny pinhole in the top, shown rather large here. And here, up, here is represented one of these tiny oil drops. Now one can see these drops falling slowly through the space by looking through with a microscope. So this circle represents what you would see looking in between the plates with a microscope. To see the tiny oil drop, one shines a bright light from an arc lamp and a lens in here, and looking in the microscope it seems like a little bright star. Now the pull of gravity, the downward pull of gravity is such that this little oil drop falls under the pull of gravity. Then when it gets down near the bottom, he would close an electric switch over here, applying a voltage to these plates. And if the oil drop had a negative charge on it, the upward force due to the electric field would cause it to rise. If it had no negative charge, it would go on down. But if it had a negative charge, it would rise. Then when it would get up near the top here before it hit the plate, he would open the circuit, take the charge off of here by grounding these two plates, and the little oil drop would fall again under the pull of gravity. Now let's look at a detailed diagram of what he saw in the microscope. Here's the field of the microscope. Here's the little hole through which an oil drop has fallen. And it falls down here due to the pull of gravity. The mass of the, uh, the, mass of the oil drop. Now don't confuse this with an electron. This is an oil drop, millions of times bigger than an electron yet so small that it can just be seen under a microscope. Pull of gravity on it downward. It falls with a constant speed under the pull of gravity because of the air. This is not in a vacuum. This is an air atmospheric pressure. You remember falling bodies reach a terminal velocity due to air friction. Objects falling fall faster and faster and faster until there comes a time when air friction pushing up is just equal to the pull of gravity downward. And then they fall with that constant speed we call terminal velocity. Now the terminal velocity for these, part, these oil drops is rather small. But from the rate of fall of the oil drop, he could calculate from the known viscosity of air the mass of these oil drops. Not the mass of an electron, but the mass of the oil drop. Now the way he did this was to have little crosshairs in here and a little scale. And using a stopwatch, he would time the fall of the drop 
as it passed this wire, he would start his stopwatch and stop it when it passed here. And then before it would hit this plate, he would turn on the electric field, and this oil drop oftentimes would have a negative charge, and it would rise. And as it rose, he would again time it from here up to here. Then he would short circuit the plates, discharge them, and the, it would drop again, and he would time its fall again. And sometimes he could run it up and down, oh, maybe 15 or 20 times. Each time finding the time of fall, and getting a better and better measure of the speed of fall, and therefore a better and better measure of the mass of the oil drop. And each time it rose, he would get a measure of the charge on here, on this oil drop, because he knew the electric field strength, and he could calculate Q of the oil drop. Now here's a little diagram to represent one of the oil drops. As it falls down due to the pull of gravity, air friction, due to the air has to stream by it, exerts an upward force, just equal to the downward force. When the field was thrown on to the, to the drop, let's suppose that there was one electron on the oil drop, and this represents an electron, tiny, tiny negative charge. Then the upward force here would be due to the electric field E times the small e, the charge on this particle. And if this force were greater than this one, the oil drop would rise. And so he found that the oil drop one time might rise rather slowly, showing a certain amount of charge on the oil drop. The next time it would rise, perhaps it would go a lot faster, showing that perhaps several negative charges happened to be on the drop the next time it rose. And then when he let it fall and let it rise the next time, there might be four on the next time. He didn't know how many. All he could do is measure the amount of charge on here. <clears throat> now the equations for this experiment are just those we've had before. The downward force due to gravity is the mass of the oil drop times acceleration of gravity. The upward force when the electric field is on is just the charge on the oil drop times the electric field intensity. Now he found these Q's and he listed them for a given oil drop all in a row. And he, what he found was this, that if he divided all of these charges capital Q by one number, that they all came out to be whole numbers. In other words, there, were, there always seemed to be a negative charge on the oil drop, which was a whole number multiple of some unit of charge. And that unit of charge that he found was divisible into all of the capital Qs was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. 1.6 times 10 to the mi minus, minus 19th coulombs. So this is assumed to be the charge on the electron. Now since that time, many hundreds of experiments, not only this experiment, but many others, have confirmed this value. Once you have the charge on the electron, you can put it in J.J. Thompson's value of E over M and calculate the only unknown, the mass of the electron. And one finds then that the mass on the electron, the mass of the electron, is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 grams. A very, very small mass. And so today we've seen the important experiments whereby one has been able to determine experimentally the ratio E over M for electrons and second, to determine the charge on the electron E by Millikan's oil drop experiment and from the two experiments to determine the mass of the electron. Electrons have a very small charge, a very, very small mass, and the two together go to make up this little thing no one has ever seen called the electron.